Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service of Christ Presbyterian Church in Hampton Cove, Alabama, where we proclaim Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Join us as we worship together and listen with your heart as teaching elder Mike Calvert brings us today's message from God's Holy Word. Good morning. If you'll take your seats, we'll get ready for uh, our worship this morning. My name's Jack Luce. I'm one of the deacons here. If any of you have a question or need uh, now or during the week, uh, feel free to contact one of your deacons and we'll do the best we can to give you some assistance. Uh, we'd like to welcome you here this morning on this kind of gray day, the first Sunday of spring break, and uh, particularly welcome our first time visitors. We're just delighted you chose to come to be with us this morning here at Christ Presbyterian Church. Uh, we would like you to do something for us, uh, give you an obligation, you just come in. We have, we'd like to get some information about you so we can contact you if you'd like. We have information cards in the back of the pew that's in front of you. If you would take that card and just fill out a few places there for some information about yourself, and you can put those in boxes or at the back of the sanctuary on your way out this morning. And if you so request, we'll contact you and, and give you more information. I do have quite a few announcements here to go through, so let me get started to get through those. Uh, I have five things. One thing is your new members class. If you'd like to be a new member, uh, we offer a class. That'll be starting next Sunday, March 19th, uh, in the afternoon, 2 to 6, here at the church. Uh, and we'll have dinner afterward. Uh, but you have to sign up this Sunday. So please do that if you'd like to join the new members class. And sign-up can be done after church at the back of the church in our narthex. There's a sign-up sheet there. We're a little short on members, so if we uh, don't have a quorum, we will not have the class. So if you'd like to do it, please remember to sign up this morning. Uh, second announcement is Sunday school lunch. Today is the second Sunday of March. We usually have a lunch after that. Uh, we're not doing that this month because of spring break. In April, our lunch will be on the first Sunday. That's a ways off, but just kind of put that in the back of your mind uh, when that comes up. Uh, all our Bible studies this week, because of spring break, have been canceled. Our spring men's retreat is at the end of the month. I'd like to remind, remind the men to please come to this. This is a, uh, something we've done annually. Uh, several times, and it's just a wonderful event to get together. It's going to be at uh, Gunnersville State Park. It's going to start Friday afternoon, March 31st, and we'll stay overnight, have some wonderful fellowship and teaching from Mike and a couple of meals together, dinner and breakfast. Uh, you need to sign up for that. Uh, you can do that on the Internet, and you can also pay on the Internet. So keep that in mind. Uh, we got a couple weeks till, till we do that. And the last announcement concerns RUF, Re, uh, Reform University Fellowship. Uh, you can sign up uh, today for RUF at, uh, at UAH. Uh, you can sign for the North X for snacks. So please look for that if you're interested in supporting our RUF. Again, we're glad to have you here. All the things I mentioned are in your bulletin or on our website if you'd look at those. And now let's have our worship. Thank you. to worship this morning from John chapter 4, the very words of our Savior. And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them 
will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Praise the Lord for the joy of worship. Will you join me as we offer our praise and adoration to our Father in prayer? Oh, Father, we thank you that you've assembled us together by the voice of your Son. And that same voice that cried out to the darkness created all that is. And that same voice cried out into the darkness of our souls and brought eternal life to us. And we thank you, Father, that in our hearts, because of your word, there is springing up within us eternal life. And we come today in praise of your gift. And we pray, Father, that you might bless us to become the people you've called us to be, the salt, the light, those who glorify you, those who walk the way Christ has commanded, those, Father, who bring you glory in all they do. May that happen to us. And bless us now with the energy and the strength and the faith to worship you and to do so in spirit and in truth and to do it unto the name that is above all names. And in that name we pray. Amen. Let's hear the reading of God's word from Exodus. God's Word read together, we are often uh, stirred to remember our own sins. And one of the great acts of worship, and this morning it's at the very beginning, is to come into the Lord's presence confessing our sins. And we've heard the story of Egypt, uh, the Israelites coming out of Egypt, and their sins of grumbling and complaining and being dissatisfied with the Lord. And we want to pray a prayer of confession as we come into the Lord's presence that He would forgive us for acting like Israel sometimes. Will you join me as we pray together? Oh, Father, we thank you that we've been summoned together to worship you by your word. And that same word that has called us has also brought conviction to our souls. And, oh, Lord, we often think of Israel as a long-forgotten nation, so irrelevant to us. And yet in that story of Exodus, we see our story. And how often we as your children we complain how often we are dissatisfied with you, how often, Father, we're not content with your blessings, how often we've asked the question, do you love us? Are you among us? Do you even care? And we come in the spirit of repentance. And, Father, we know that as we come into your presence with broken hearts, you will not turn us away, that you delight in broken hearts and in contrite spirits. And we lift up our prayers of confession with the confidence that you love us, that you will not judge us, that you have judged our Savior. And who, like the one Paul speaks of, that one who was of the rock, providing life for Israel in the wilderness, you are the rock that gives us the life we need in Christ now. And as we confess, we receive your mercy, and we pray that we might worship you as people who have been set free from the power of sin and who know the mercy and the grace of God. And, O oh, Father, we remember as we pray your words, 
Verily, verily, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. We thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we have something to sing about. Let's stand together, find in your hymnals, hymn number 115, and let's offer our praises to the Lord.
You may be seated. And as you're being seated, will you find in your order of service our reading of the Psalms? And this morning we'll read it together responsibly. And these are the words of Psalm 95, the first seven verses of this wonderful psalm of praise. And of course, the book of Psalms is in the Bible to help us not only praise Him and to help us sing, but also to help us pray. And let's make this not only a a song we sing in our hearts as we record and recite these words, but a prayer, a prayer that we sound out together. Join me. You read your part. I'll begin with mine. And together, let's make a joyful noise to the Lord. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come. For the Lord is a great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Praise the Lord for his word. Hymn number 498 is our anthem of praise. And are we thankful that Jesus is a friend for sinners? Hymn 498. Remain seated as we sing together. If you would open the Word of God with me to Romans chapter 5, our New Testament reading will be from a magnificent passage from this epistle to the Romans, Romans 5, 1 to 11. And I'm actually going to appeal to the last verse of, verse of chapter 4 uh, to get a running start, because you'll notice in verse 1 of chapter 5, there's the word, therefore. Uh, which points us back up to what has been said before, immediately before, and that would be verse 25 of chapter 4. And so let's get a running start, and I'll read from the English Standard Version through verse 11 of chapter 5. Who was, that is Christ, delivered up for our trespasses 
and raised for our justification. And therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we've also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one dare even to die. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, we will be saved by his life. And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The blessed word of the Lord, and may he bless its reading and its believing as we've heard the Lord speak to us. We enter our time of church prayer now, and I'll encourage you Uh, to look at the back of your bulletin and you'll see the people we pray for. You'll see uh, our our missionaries and their names and those who are planting churches and we support them not only locally but around the world and you'll also see those that we pray for who have chronic illnesses or uh, illnesses uh, of a short-term nature and I want to to give you two names to pray for uh, as we go in prayer. First, we've uh, sadly learned about the death of Uh, Sharon Daughtry's brother-in-law. This is the uh, husband of her sister uh, Carla, and we want to pray for that family today. Also, the infant son of Matthew and Rebecca Thompson, little Elijah Thompson, who was just born not long ago, is having some surgery uh, this Wednesday. And so pray for little Elijah Thompson and his mom and dad. Of course, we pray for the Guytons, who are expecting twins. Uh, later this month, actually. And then it's good to see Frankie Garcia here and Elena. Frankie is our church planter from uh, Canada. Uh, Of course, he's one of us and grew up here and uh, trained at Reform Seminary in Jackson, and we've deployed him into Canada to plant a PCA church. And it's always wonderful to have our missionaries uh, stopping by and to see your face. And so we'll remember them, especially in our prayers. As we read the Bible, one of the great things we discover is that there are dozens of names that God is known by. Not just one name, but dozens of names by which he's revealed himself in the Word of God. And you know many of them and could probably recite many of them uh, just from memory. And we're going to think about some of those names as we pray. Those names tell us who God is and what he does. And we'll craft our prayer this morning using some of the great names by which God has revealed himself. Join me uh, silently as I lead us aloud in our time of prayer. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are the Lord of peace. And in this world of great turmoil and tribulation, and even experiencing that in our souls, we thank you that you are our peace. That peace does not come by a treaty It does not come by negotiations. It comes through Christ. And you, Father, are the author and the source and the guarantee of our peace. And we thank you that we have peace with you now. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are our shepherd, that you are the one who shepherds your people, and you bring us to pathways of joy and streams of living water. And even when you carry us through dark valleys, you are with us as our shepherd. And your rod and your staff always defend us. We give you praise. Father, we thank you that you are the Lord, our righteousness, for we have none on our own. And we can worship today. We can say your name. We can 
preach your word. We can hear your word. We can expect the joys of heaven to be ours because you are our righteousness. You are our glory. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are the Lord most high. And everywhere we look, we see men and nations exalting themselves. And yet none are as powerful or as highly exalted as you are. That you reign supreme over every king and over every kingdom, good kingdoms and bad kingdoms alike. And that your kingdom is superior to all. That you are the Lord most high, higher than the angels, higher than the heavens. Your glory is so great that not even all of creation can contain it. You are the king without rival, the Lord most high. Father, we thank you that you are the Lord, our counselor. And we come to worship, Father, not only to give you our praises, but to bring our burdens to you. And we know that through your word, you will counsel us, that you will speak tenderly to us through your word. And we need that today. There are those of us in the throes of, of a nightmarish experience of suffering in some way others in the throes of decisions others in despair anxiety and we need your word that brings healing that brings consolation and so we thank you in advance that you are our counselor father you are the rock and the refuge of your people and though we see fiery darts of the enemy flying to and fro we thank you that we are sheltered safely in the rock our salvation and we thank you father for the the confidence that we have that nothing will touch us that does not first pass through your loving hands that you are our fortress our shield our defender and you are all we need as our rock and refuge father we thank you that you are the lord our healer and we come today to lift up those in distress, those on our prayer list who suffer physically this morning, or particularly those who continue to suffer chronic illnesses, that you would not only, Father, where it's your will, heal their bodies, but give them hope, give them peace. And even should your will be that they endure their affliction, that there would be joy even in that, strength in that. And we thank you, Father, for the promise of new life, that there are twins coming to the guidance and bless those twins in the womb now to be shielded and protected to be cradled in your love and delivered at the right time that mama and babies will be fine and that these covenant children will come into this world ready to serve you and we pray for little Elijah Thompson today we pray that you'll bless the surgeons who will operate on him and that this surgery will go well without any complications and that he'll heal quickly and that mama and daddy can have peace as they lay their son in the surgeon's arms and knowing that he's really in the arms of the great physician our healer father we pray for those suffering loss particularly Sharon Daughtry's sister and their family that you would bring the power and the glory and the hope of the resurrection into their time of suffering and others lord among us who have suffered the loss of a friend or family member that you would bless them with the peace that you give the the hope you give even in death and that you'll be with them to walk with them through this dark valley and to come out on the other side knowing that you were good and you were faithful father you are the lord our provider and we come today as instructed by Jesus, praying for our daily bread, thanking you for that bread. And even when our cupboards are full, we still thank you that everything we have comes from you. We have nothing but that which you provide. And we are simply stewards of all the blessings you give. And we thank you that you richly supply what we need. And we pray for more. Whatever we need for life and godliness this week, that you would provide and that we'll be content with all that you provide wanting nothing more than what you give father we thank you that you are the lord who is always with us that we have your presence wherever we go wherever we are and may we never forget that you will not leave or forsake those whom you love and you are the lord who sanctifies us you are father not 
not content just to save us, but you want to make us holy. And we ask, Lord, that not only through uh, experiences in life, but through the preaching and teaching of your word that you will sanctify us, sanctify our individual lives, sanctify our marriages, Father, sanctify our homes, our children, that wherever we are, we will bear the mark of belonging to you, that mark of holiness, that we've been set apart only for you. And make us clean, give us clean hands and a pure heart. And let us run to you when we sin and let us be quick to repent and quick to forgive those who sin against us. And then, Father, we thank you that you are the Lord who speaks, that you are not silent, that you've given us your holy word. And we ask now that through the preacher, that the voice of Jesus might be heard, that through the written word, the living word will encounter us and we encounter him. And that we'll listen and hear what you say to your bride today. And that we might be changed by your great word, by its power. That we will be forever the ch ever changed, never the same. Oh, how we pray for that. In all of this, we lift to you in that strong name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let's find the gospel according to Luke, uh, chapter 11 and verse 1. You will remember that we've been looking at the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray as recorded by Luke. And this would be somewhat parallel to the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. There are some differences that we'll point out along the way. But you'll remember that this prayer has been recorded by Luke in the context of of one of the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to pray. And so the scene that Luke uh, sets before us is that Jesus has already been praying, and uh, one of the disciples, having witnessed Christ and listened to the Lord uh, pray, uh, came to Christ with that request. And so let's read these words together, and uh, you'll see in verse 1 that very setting, Luke 11, 1. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And so with those words, we find Jesus replying to the request of the disciple, the unnamed disciple, to teach them uh, to pray. Uh, this man was moved by the Lord's example. He was so deeply impressed with what he saw and heard uh, coming from the mouth of Jesus that he said, teach, Lord, teach us to pray like that. Now, of course, this is Luke's version of that prayer known as the Lord's Prayer. And as we've said before, maybe we should call it the Disciples' Prayer because this is the prayer that Jesus taught uh, the disciples to pray. And the reason it's different than we find in Matthew is because this is a different setting than in Matthew. These are two different expressions of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, the prayer in Matthew is longer. The prayer in Luke is shorter. And I wonder, uh, having just read this prayer, did you notice what's missing? Did you notice those elements of the prayer that Luke does not record? Now, why is there a difference? Well, number one, because Christ taught this prayer more than once. Uh, all good teachers repeat themselves. And uh, they do so especially on a topic as vital as prayer. Uh, but it would be natural for the Lord to, to change some of the language, like any teacher might. And there may be some things working in the mind of our Lord as he crafted this prayer that were particularly relevant to that crowd that he was teaching, which was a different crowd than we find in Matthew 6. So nevertheless, this is another version of the Lord's Prayer. Now, what we're going to be doing the next several weeks, as you probably guessed, is walking through very carefully this simple prayer. 
looking at all of the elements and trying to learn how to pray like Jesus prayed. And we're going to begin at the very beginning this morning, and our focus for the next few minutes will be on the opening word of this prayer. And look, if you will, at that word, and I know you've seen it before, you say it all the time, and we don't want to become too familiar with it so that we would not learn from it. It is the word Father. Father. That's the word we're going to focus on this morning. Now, before we uh, really get going good, I want to make a, a few observations about this prayer and maybe about prayer in general that will get us rolling. You can see that this prayer is set before us in the first place. It is set before us in the context of Christ's own praying. And so the Lord was a man of prayer, and he would, he would really... He would really, in one sense, not have the power to teach prayer if he weren't a man of prayer. And so he's a man of prayer. He's going to teach what he's doing. Christ is a, a teacher who practices what he preaches. He's a true teacher. He doesn't just say, do what I say do. He is going to say, do what I do, and here's how you do it. Secondly, True Christian prayer cannot be separated from true Christian theology. We're going to do some theologizing as we walk through this prayer in the next few weeks. All prayer is an expression of theology. And for a prayer to be truly Christian, it must express truly Christian truths or uh, theology. And we might even uh, say it this way, that all true prayer, all authentic Christian praying stands upon those things that Jesus himself taught. And so we listen not only to what Jesus said when he prayed, but we listen to what Jesus taught because that also informs our prayers. Third, prayer is not our invention. It is God's invention. It is the Lord who summons us to pray. It is the Lord who teaches us uh, to pray. And so prayer, if it's to be God-honoring, needs to be shaped by God's will. It's His invention. It's His institution. It's His tool for our sanctification. And so we have to use it according to His pattern. And so we look to Jesus, of course, to learn how to pray. Fourth, and we've said this one before, while praying is natural for Christians. It is. While praying is natural for Christians, nevertheless, it must be taught. There is a language of prayer that we must engage in. And so Jesus is going to teach us how to pray. And here before us is a model or a framework or the language upon which we should structure our prayers. Of course, there are many prayers in the Bible. You can find prayers of individuals. You can find prayers of groups. You can find prayers of the prophets. You can find prayers of the apostles. You can find prayers of normal people scattered all throughout Scripture. But I would argue that in some way, they all resemble this prayer. And that brings us to the very first word in this prayer, Father. Why would Jesus begin praying with the word Father? Well, let me answer that question with another question. The big question. When people pray, to whom are they praying? Now, that's the question. You see, uh, in the world today, virtually everybody speaks of prayer. Just listen to the language bouncing around on every street corner and maybe embracing in some way every conversation. Everybody talks about prayer. I mean, certainly Christians talk about prayer. That's part of what we do. We pray. And, and so Christians frequently talk about prayer as we would expect. But even non-Christians talk about prayer. I'm praying for a rainy day. I'm praying for a dry day. I'm praying. I'm praying for a raise. And people say that who don't even practice prayer. They just talk about prayer kind of in a, a common way. And then you've got, you've got 
non-Christian religions practice prayer. Buddhists pray. Muslims pray. Hindus pray. Jewish people pray. All the adherents to all the great religions, they all practice some form of prayer. The non-Christian groups pray. The the Mormons pray. And the Jehovah's Witnesses pray. And and the cults pray. The, 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 The Scientologists pray. And the New Agers pray. Everybody prays. So the question is, to whom are we praying? Who are you talking to when you pray? And of course, Jesus answers that question right up front. Father, when you pray, Jesus says in verse 2, say, Father, Father. Now, here's where we have to stop and, and get in the, uh, the, 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 the Star Trek beam machine, whatever you call that thing. You get in the transporter room and you get transported back to the first century because we're reading Luke's gospel in English. Luke wrote his gospel in Koine or common Greek, but Jesus was speaking Aramaic. Are you with me? We're reading in English what Luke wrote in Greek, what Jesus said in Aramaic. Are you with me? And so the word here, the word in the Greek language, is the common word for father. That's the word we know, father, pater, father. Uh, Our word paternal is a derivative of that ancient root. That's the word Luke wrote, but that's not the word Jesus spoke. And the word Jesus spoke is the Aramaic word Abba. When you pray... If you were listening to him and you spoke Aramaic like everybody did there in Israel, you would have heard Jesus say, pray this way, Abba, Abba. Now, you've heard that before, haven't you? You've read that before. You've read that perhaps in Romans chapter 8, where as Christians we are enjoined to cry out, Abba, Father. So in, in essence, every Christian needs to learn a little Aramaic, right? At least one word. That we pray, we say Abba, and then Paul says it again in Galatians chapter 4, that we pray Abba, Father. Now, where is Paul getting that from? Well, he's getting it from Jesus, but let me, let me point you to one text in the Gospels that brings this all together. In Mark 14, 36, Mark tells us that Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was about to go to the cross, And he prayed those familiar words, let this cup pass from me. Mark records that. But listen to the unique way that Mark records that. In the English translation of Mark 14, 36, Jesus says, Abba, Father. Both words. Abba, Father. So Paul got this idea of crying out Abba from Jesus because that's the word Jesus used Every time he started a prayer, he said, Abba. Now, what does that word mean? Well, we know it means Father. We know it's a translation, or rather, it is translated as Father. We know that, but what does it mean? Maybe the best definition I've read lately of that word Abba is that it is a mature yet affectionate way for adults to speak of their fathers. A mature yet affectionate way, a way of speaking of your father with reverence, with respect, uh, communicating an intimate and loving relationship. All of that is compressed into this word, Abba, Father, the word we are to use. In fact, if you really want to use that word, but you don't want to say Abba, a more direct translation would be, Dear Father, Dear Father. And so let's think of it that way. Jesus is responding to this disciple's request to teach us to pray. And he says, when you pray, say this, Dear Father, dear Father, intimacy, respect, reverence, and yet closeness, all compressed into this word, Abba. Now that's who we're talking to, our Father, one who is our Father. Now, Another question we might raise that would be very rudimentary 
at least on the surface, would be, why is Jesus praying like that? Why is he saying Abba, or Father, when he prays, and why is he commanding us to say Father when we pray? What does he mean? Well, here's where the theology comes in. We pray, and we begin the word with the word Father because that is the most important question theologically that we could raise. Who is God? Who is he? Who has God revealed himself to be? That's a very fundamental question. What word has been used with more power and emphasis in the scriptures to describe the God of the Bible than any other word. What is it? What word is used by Jesus more often than any way of speaking of God? What word is it? It is the word Father. Because God has revealed himself as Father. Now, let me caution us about making a mistake that we might all make if we weren't careful. When I say the word Father, uh, I I conjure up images of my father. My father. Uh, I, I even go further than that. I think about my grandfathers. And I knew one of my great grandfathers, and I think of him. And so my mind goes to my earthly fathers, and and that happens to you. For good or ill, when I say the word father, you're thinking about your father as a good man or as not so good a man. And that's the way it is with earthly fathers. But that's not what we're to think of when we think of the word father. Don't be thinking about your earthly father, whether he was a hero or a goat. (laughs) All right? When you think of the word Father, you have to think theologically, you have to think biblically, and think of the first Father. There were no fathers before Him. Earthly fathers are a dim reflection of the first Father. It's not the other way around. It's not that God is like a Father. It's that human fathers are supposed to be like God. And so we think about God, who has revealed himself from beginning to the end in Scripture as Father. Let me give you some examples, just a couple of them. Where do we see this early on in the Bible? Well, in Exodus chapter 4, Moses, and we've already thought about this this morning as Dr. Matthew read from Exodus. We've, we've thought about the, the, the capture of the Israelites. There they are, uh, 400 years in slavery in Egypt. And God raises up Moses. And God says, Moses, I got a job for you. You're going to go down to Pharaoh, march down to his office. And you're going to say, let my people go. And listen to the words God gave Moses to say to Pharaoh about releasing the Israelites. God says, then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn, and I say to you, let my son go. Do you see that? God is speaking of Israel as his son. And, and uh, you know, you can do the math on that. If that's right, then Israel is the son and God is the father. That's my son, and so let Israel go. Think about Deuteronomy chapter 1. And there Moses says, in the wilderness, the Lord God carried you, that is, carried Israel, as a man carries his own son. And there the image is of a weak son who is injured or he's sick, and a loving father picks him up, and he carries him to safety. And God is saying, Israel, those are my sons. I am your father, and I am taking care of you. What an incredible image. I want you to think about a hymn. And every now and then we sing it here. It's one of my favorite. I I hear it and I hearken back to my days as a young Baptist boy. And we sang this beautiful hymn so frequently. Have thine own way, Lord. Now, what a beautiful hymn text. But you know where that hymn text came from? And you can think of the verses of that hymn. That hymn text came from Isaiah 64, 8. Listen to this. Isaiah says, but now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay. 
You are the potter. That's where that beautiful hymn came from. You are our Father. You're the potter. We are the clay. Have thine own way. And then Isaiah, again in 64, 16, You, Lord, are our Father, our Redeemer. And so there's plenty of evidence in the Old Testament for God revealing himself as Father. And, of course, Jesus talked about God's fatherhood let me give you some statistics I know there are those of you out there that love numbers let me give you a number or so over 60 times in the Gospels we have just four Gospels over 60 times in the Gospels Jesus calls God father father he'll talk about my father he'll talk about your father But he's always speaking about God as Father. Someone has written that this word Father is the very heart of the prayer life of Jesus. Father. God is my Father. Now, why is that such a big deal? How should that resonate with us this morning? Well, let me tell you what you ought to be thinking about right now. What happened to the human race in Genesis chapter 3? Well, typically theologians will say the human race fell into sin, and that's true. We fell. From our original righteousness, we fell into sin, and we fell into uh, spiritual death. And we were alienated from God and cast out of the garden and, and doomed to die and go to hell except for the mercy of God. But let me give you another way to think about what happened in Genesis 3. We orphaned ourselves. We became orphans. We turned our back on our Father, and we wandered off into oblivion as orphans for all intents and purposes. Someone has said, that the more mature and knowing that you become, the more you learn about life, and the more you realize how graceless, how fatherless, how terribly orphaned the world is. What an image of a human being outside of Christ's mercy, outside of salvation. What an image of a society, a society of orphans and everyone's doing that which is right in his own eyes there is no father to command us and to comfort us and to lead us and to guide us everybody's their own daddy everybody's making the rules up for themselves the world is a place of orphans the world itself is orphaned and that's how significant this word father is someone has said the history of the world the history of the world taken as a whole is a story of war deeply marked with the hoof prints of the apocalyptic horseman. It is the story of humanity without a father, so it seems. What a commentary on the world today. And so Jesus comes, sent by the Father to do something about our act of rebellion, to bring us back into the place where by mercy and grace and through faith and repentance we can say, Abba, Father. The only people authorized to say Father when they look to heaven are those who've been redeemed by Jesus. The only people authorized by God to look to heaven and say, that's my father are those who've come to know him through his son and have come home from the orphanage and been brought into a new family leaving uh, the the world of death and sin and coming in to the kingdom of light where you have a father and a family and a lord and a king that's why jesus said pray this way now i know you know all that I know you are not among those who need convincing of those truths. So let's cycle down a little further and talk about this word father 
First in terms of our discipleship and then in terms of our prayers. And let's see what we can learn. What does God's fatherhood mean for all disciples of Jesus? What does it mean for you and me right now who belong to this father? Let me give you some things to think about. Well, first, it means that we are never alone, ever. We are never alone. We are no longer orphaned by our sins. We are never alone to face the judgment of God, the one who is not our Father. Rather, we have been saved from the wrath of God by the Father. And He will never leave us alone. He loves us. And so what father would abandon his child? Well, no good father would. And so the first father would never abandon those he loves. He would never leave them alone. He would never put them in the valley of the shadow of death and then walk away. He would never let them get smashed under the weight of sin or the weight of anxiety or worldly situations. He would never let that happen and leave them to suffer alone. No father would leave his child in peril. And so he will never leave us. And though we don't see him now, And though we don't see our Savior now, we have the pledge from heaven that our Father is present with us. He never is going anywhere. He is with us. Our Father is as far away as our voice. Father, Father, and He's there. And only a Christian can say that. Did you know something? This is an interesting little trivia piece from church history. And it's going to be shocking to you. But did you know that the early Christians were so committed to this idea that only Christians could call God Father, that when they assembled for worship and they said the Lord's Prayer, they would make an announcement and they would say, if you don't believe in Christ, you are not authorized to pray this prayer. That's how bold they were, how audacious they were. This is a prayer only disciples can pray. And so only a disciple can say, my Father will never leave me. Or forsake me. That's the first thing. The second thing is we are always wrapped up and sheltered in the fatherly affection of God. Always. And I don't know what's the best image of that. I've thought, uh, I've thought all day uh, and, and throughout the week, I've thought about what, what a mom does to a little infant. And uh, you, you have a little baby, particularly if the weather is cold, and you watch mama wrap that baby up. In, like a little cocoon, you know, and, and that little baby, apparently babies like that. They're kind of all squeezed in together, and you've seen some of the mamas now wearing the baby right there on the front of their body. They got this thing that hangs over there like a pack, and they got a little baby stuffed in that pack, and he's just there, or she's just there like that, wrapped up tightly, and that's the image that's popped into my mind. The father has his arms around you. That's what dads do for their children. They wrap their arms around them. And they give them always their affection, their fatherly affection. And that's the way that God the Father loves you. Let me give you another way to think about the way God loves you and the way He surrounds you with fatherly affection. Think of this. Our Father loves you as much as, to the degree that, He loves you his only son. Isn't that amazing? In the miracle of God's grace, in the miracle of justification, in the miracle of of us being brought from death to life and being born again, Almighty God loves me the way God the Father loves God the Son. He loves me and you and those he saved with an infinite love, with a divine love, with an eternal love, with an indestructible love. And you can add all those attributes to it you want to, those attributes of deity. They all can be ascribed to God's love. His eternal love is for me and for you. And you always have that. You're always wrapped up in that. You'll never, ever come unwound from that cocoon of his love and fatherly affection. Third, we are protected and safe in the confines of our Father's omnipotence. Omnipotence. I uh, am amused like you are when you see the bumper stickers, you know, uh, and they're, frankly, they're prideful, aren't they? You know, my 
son's an honor student, you know. It, my parents had a sticker that said, we're just glad our, ki our kid makes a D every now and then, you know. And you see the little sticker that says, my dad can beat up your dad. <laughs> you haven't met my dad. If you think that your dad can beat up my dad, you haven't given met my dad, because my dad is the creator of the universe. <laughs> he is the omnipotent one. Oh, no, no, he's not the guy that's 86 years old now. No, no, my father is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is omnipotent, and he is watching over me. He is protecting me. He is protecting you. He is protecting his church. I want to read you something said by one of the greatest preachers in the 20th century. And he wrote this, and it's worth hearing. Everything our Father permits the dark powers of this world to do must first pass in review before Him. Everything is examined and censored by His fatherly eye to see whether it will really work for good to those who love Him. And because this is true, a great transformation takes place. Our sufferings become trials which are meant to be endured in order that I may be purged and refined like the precious metal of gold. The great times of terror in which the furies of man's brutality and blindness and hubris are unleashed become times of blessed visitation. The dreadful valleys of the shadow which I must traverse become places where I learn to know the good shepherd and I learn to test his rod and his staff. The anxieties that torment me as I face the insecurity of my existence and those dark foreboding clouds that surround me become the raw material from which I build my trust in God. And that's what you get. When you have God as your Father, you get the promise that He will protect you and shield you and filter everything through His fingers before they touch you. And nothing will come to you that is not designed and purposed to be good and glorifying, good for you and glorifying to Him. That's what your Father gives you because He's a strong Father. And maybe one more, because He's our Father. We have the promise of his eternal treasures. How rich is our dad? How much money did your dad leave you? Or your granddad? Or your uncle? Or some family member? It may be a lot. It may be nothing. But I'll tell you what, it cannot be measured by the degree to which God has blessed you. What's in the will? What's in the Father's will for His sons? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Everything. He owns the universe. He owns it all. There's no bank big enough. There's no vault. Big, there's no safety deposit box. There's no calculator that can calculate the wealth of what God has promised to you who are His children. All we can say is, according to the Scriptures, it is the eternal treasures of Christ. And it will take us eternity to go through the deposit that's on account for us. It will take forever to open that vault and explore the treasures. It will take forever to read the list of all the things He's left us in Christ. What a wealthy Father. What a loving Father we have. Now, that's why... Jesus says begin with father because he really is your father and that's what it means as we serve him but what does it mean in our prayers how can starting with the word father help our prayers well let me give you some encouragement number one Jesus is teaching us that our father welcomes and receives all of our prayers even though they are stained with many sins and much folly. Have you ever gone to your dad or your mom when you were a kid and asked for something stupid? Yeah. And I'm borrowing language from Luther. Luther says God loves us so much that he hears our stupid prayers. <laughs> dad, I want a motorcycle. 
Dad, I want you to buy me an airplane. One of the great mysteries that I experienced as a boy was way back yonder when my dad was an insurance salesman. And let's just say for easy math, he was bringing home $400 a week. Well, there were four members of our family, and I never could figure out why I couldn't have 100 bucks of that every week. You know, if dad's making 400 and there's four of us, why can't I have 100? A great mystery. You know, why? Why? Stupid thing. Dad, can I have a hundred? No, you can't have a hundred dollars. You're six years old. <laughs> you cannot have a hundred dollars. We ask for stupid things. But you know what? Our Father receives our prayers, even though they are stained with many sins and much folly and are frequently lacking wisdom. He lets us speak to Him. He says, Come into my office, as it were, and tell me what's on your heart. Just tell me. Tell me that old gospel hymn, just a little talk with Jesus. Let's have a talk. Son, what's on your heart? And God invites us in prayer to tell him what's on our hearts. Isn't that something? But it doesn't just stop there. He empowers our prayers through the ministry of his spirit. Prayer is hard, isn't it? Though it's natural, though we cry out. It's yet very difficult, but how do we do it? Well, we depend on our Father's power. We ask our Father, not only teach me to pray, but empower me to pray. And we have the assurance in the Word that He will send His Spirit and He will help us pray. Isn't that something? He invites us to speak to Him, and then He empowers us to speak to Him. Isn't that amazing? I will send my Spirit to you to quicken you, to motivate you, to move you to prayer. Depend on me. It's the third thing he does. He infuses our weak prayers with a vibrant faith so that we can see that our Father is always at work even in this cruel, hard, fatherless world. In other words, he spares us futility in prayer. He infuses our weak prayers that are prayed from anxiety and prayed from doubt. And he infuses them with faith so that in the atmosphere of affliction or the unseen forces that seem to be waiting at the door to consume us any moment, he infuses our prayers with faith that can see that God reigns. Our Father reigns is in charge. It may look like Pharaoh's army is outnumbered and can't be defeated, but we haven't got to the Red Sea just yet. You hang on and wait on your father. Trust him. Trust him. Your father is at work nevertheless, even though you can't see him. And he infuses our prayers with the faith to see what we can't see, that God is always at work in this world to will and to work for his good pleasure. And then, I love this one, The Father adjusts our prayers, doesn't He? He adjusts them. If you pray long enough, He's going to change you and He's going to change me. He changes us as we pray. If you've known the Lord for a long time, you've had this experience. You've been praying for something for a long time and it hasn't happened yet. But over time, I would suggest and I would would venture a bet that you're praying about that situation has changed it's changed and one of the reasons God takes us through long seasons where it appears we're not being answered is that he might change the way we pray see prayer is a means of grace that is it is a means of sanctifying grace it is the way God changes us as we labor in prayer as we as we feel like we're bouncing off the ceiling and we think that he's not hearing, that's helping us change the way we pray. Change the things we want. It gives us wisdom. He's changing our longings. He's letting that time of struggle and prayer be an appropriate season where my longings can be reshaped, where I will begin wanting what God wants. And he may reduce me, as he's done many times, he may reduce me to saying, Lord, I don't know what to pray. Your will be done. 
I, I don't know. Lord, let your, I don't have the wisdom to know what's best. I tell you what I want, but I'm not sure that's wise. And so, Father, let your will be done. And that is a, a sweet place to be when you can pray that way. Lord, I want your will, no matter what it is. And so we're changed as we interact with our Father in prayer. And then I hate to mention this one because it's so convicting to this old preacher. But as we pray in the name of Christ to our Father, our Father is teaching us the blessings of contentment and waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. Uh, you, you can't go far in the Bible, and you can't go far at all in the book of Psalms without running into that phrase, wait on the Lord, wait on the Lord. That is be content, be content. And we learn that as we fight the fight of prayer, as we converse with our Father in the power of the Spirit, in the name of the Son, we, we learn the discipline of contentment of just trusting Him, just having Him. I was thinking this morning about Job, and I would never, ever compare myself to any saint in the Old Testament except the bad ones. <laughs> I would never compare myself to Job, but I thought about Job. And I thought of that transaction between the devil and the Lord there in the opening verses of Job. And Satan says, look at Job, he's a great man, and he's only serving you, God, because you're good to him. And I'll bet you, if you weren't good to him, he would curse you to your face. And the Lord said, well, let's find out. Do with him what you will. Just don't take his life. And so you know, Job's life falls apart. Falls apart in a way that probably none of us will ever experience. At least I hope not. And you know, Job goes through an enormous battle and struggle with his own family, with his wife with his friends, with himself. And he comes to the end of the book, and it's as if he says, you're worth serving whether or not you are ever good to me, for I am content with you. I am content. Take away everything, and I'm still going to serve you. Don't ever send me a blessing. If that's your will, I'm still going to serve you. I need, at the end of the day, nothing but to know that I'm yours. And that's what our Father wants to teach us through the ups and downs of the Christian life and through the ups and downs of our prayer life, through those seasons of praying and having no answer, of praying and feeling like the Lord is not tracking with us, that he's not listening. And we know that's not true, but even in those times of frustration, he is teaching us, as a father would, to be content with having just him. And so there you have it. That's how Christians start their prayers. They say, Father. Now let's back up. Think about what you've just witnessed in the Word. The Son of God, your Savior and Lord, the one who has shed his blood for you and been raised from the dead for you and washed your sins away has said to you, pray, pray, and say, Father, to pray like Jesus did. To pray is an act of adoration and the worship of your Father. To pray as an expression of your love to your Father. To pray in the atmosphere of humble dependence upon your Father. And when you do, there is an avenue of blessing that you cannot describe in human language. The blessing of calling Him Father and knowing His love. And that every time you seek His face, He will be there. And you then can pray without ceasing every moment of the day at whatever time and whatever place you choose, on your knee, not on your knee, in your closet, in your car, at work, wherever you are, you have the right, the authority to say, Father, Abba, Abba. So now let's pray.
like Jesus taught us. May God bless the preaching of his holy word. Amen. Will you join me in that wonderful exercise of prayer just for a moment? Oh, Father, we thank you that we can say that one word. And we could spend all of eternity praising you just for that one glorious truth. Whereas once we were children of the devil, according to your word, we are now sons of God through faith in Christ. And we thank you for the cost that was paid to give us the privilege to say, Father, we think of your son on the cross. We think of the bread of this sacrament, the cup of this sacrament, and our Lord's life taken on the cross, given on the cross. And that's what it cost us to have the privilege to say, Abba, Father. And we pray in this moment that we will be so moved by what Jesus did that we will become a people of fervent prayer, prayer without ceasing, that we will be a people who seek the face of the Lord continually, who call upon him while he is near, and that as we pray, you will change us, you would heal us, you would sanctify us, mature us, unify us, teach us, use us, embolden us, all this through our prayers, and that you would even Help us pray the right prayers. Father, would you so bend our wills toward yours that what we ask for will indeed be for your will. And now bless us to be nourished together and then to be strengthened that we might serve the one we call Father. And in Christ's name, we make that prayer. Amen. Would you take your order of service for our morning confession? And this comes from the Westminster Larger Catechism. And for the next few weeks, we'll be walking through some of our confessional statements about prayer and uh, all keyed into the Lord's Prayer. And this is certainly uh, related to that, and, and uh, it's related to the opening word and line in the prayer. And I'll raise the question, and you read with me the answer aloud. Question 189. What does the opening of the Lord's Prayer teach us? The opening of the Lord's Prayer teaches us Confident. Reverently and in every way. The opening. Well, it would be hard to say it better than that. And I hope that encourages you and helps you. I want you to think about what the confession says here about praying like a child, like a child. I, 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 I want to tell you what, what I thought of this morning. Um, I thought of the excitement of a child. You know, if you know your dad is great and good and powerful and loves you, you can't keep your feet still. There is an excitement about your dad, your father. There's an excitement. There's a joy. Y your feet get busy. You kind of, you can't stand still. You, you just want to be with him and you want to do anything he tells you to do. And I think that's kind of what's in mind here is that we need to be like little children. We have a great father, a great father who loves us. And so we should be, and I mean in an appropriate way, very excited about that. We, we should let that sort of frame our day that we we're we're going to get to wake up tomorrow morning and serve our father and he will be with us wherever we go and we can speak to him all along the way and he will empower us and surround us with his love and it's sort of like it's sort of like when you were a little child and they had that day at school where you bring your daddy to lunch and you take him through the cafeteria with you and he sits where you sit and he eats with you. It's almost like that. And wherever you go, you go as a child of your father. And there's a holy excitement about that. I pray we will have that. And, of course, when Jesus was about to be crucified, he met with the disciples, 
And all of the Father's plans from eternity began to take shape. They began to think, okay, this is what it meant. And so Jesus taught them, I've come to do my Father's will, which is to have my body and my soul crushed on the cross in place of you under the wrath of God. It's your Father's will that I die and spill my blood to wash your sins away. And I imagine that once the cobwebs cleared from their minds and the shock of that and the Spirit had come at Pentecost, these men understood what had just happened to them. They had been commissioned by Jesus to go serve that Father, knowing that their sins had been forgiven, their eternal destiny had been sealed, and nothing could separate them from His love, and they could go conquer the world. And there's a great sense in which we should feel that same thing right now. We should be strengthened now that we have heard our Savior, we're going to experience His presence here and His Word, and we're going to be reassured of our Father's love and go back out to serve Him without fear, without compromise, boldly, boldly, with excitement like a child. May God do that this morning for us. Father, thank You for the bounty of blessings You give us, the bread we have, the full cupboards, all the material things that you have been so gracious to grant. We thank you. And for this gift of bread that represents our Savior's body, this gift of the cup that represents his blood, we thank you. And we pray that the lesson will not be lost on us, that we could experience now our Savior's presence and your love, and that with strength and renewed vigor, we might enter the world and serve you with great joy and excitement. May that happen for your glory, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Those who run to it are saved and safe. What a mighty God we serve. Praise his name. Would you stand with me, and let's prepare to sing our closing hymn, Before the Throne. The words are in the order of service. And one final word, and that is, if you would like to know more about us as a church, or if you have some spiritual question or need, we would be thrilled to tell you about our Savior and about the work of our church. If you would like to investigate a little more further, we have a new members class next week. You need to sign up today, today's the deadline, and you may find a sign-up list at the table in the North East. We'd love for you to come and learn about the work of our church. Now let's sing to the Lord. The words are here.
One of my all-time favorite benedictions comes from the little book of Philippians, and it's this word to you from God. May the peace of God that passes all comprehension guard your hearts and minds wherever you go and whatever you do. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This online worship service is brought to you by Christ Presbyterian Church. Visit our sanctuary at 288 Old Highway 431 South in Hampton Cove, Alabama, each Sunday morning at 1030, and you can join us in proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. To learn more about Christ Presbyterian Church, visit us online at ChristPresHamptonCove.org.